Frankie. Scott's Family, Chapter One. As the store manager of a jewelry shop, I had to go through the inventory properly, and that meant that late nights were inevitable sometimes. So when I woke up quite late that morning, I was mildly relieved that it was not a school day. The children didn't have to wake up early to meet the bus, so I was relatively lucky. As I stumbled down the stairs, I heard the high-pitched, excited voice of Caesar, who, from previous experience, would no doubt be playing with one of his toy cars. I also heard the serious and cautioning voice of Lily. I could picture the whole scenario before I even entered the kitchen. Caesar was playing with his toy, and Lily was warning him not to run the car over her books. Lily was quite the bookworm. She always had her face buried in one book or another. The other voice I could hear was that of my mother, calling the children to come to have their breakfast, and that was the entire trigger I needed. Just like that, as though it felt like only yesterday, the fresh feel of loss hit me. I could feel the tears threatening to fall, but I didn't allow it for the sake of the children, Lily especially, who had known her mother a little. I tried to steer myself away, but it wasn't easy. It had been seven years now, but it still feels like yesterday that my wife died. She was young and in her prime, and the most beautiful soul I had ever met. I was convinced the world did not deserve her, with her long brunette hair, her eyes that shone when she was excited or up to mischief, and then her beautiful mind. Trish was as intelligent as they came. She was a doctor. We met at a party of a mutual friend and had been inseparable since then. I knew she was the one from the very moment I set my eyes on her. She was everything I wanted and more. She was my best friend, lover, wife, and eventually the mother of my children. My life couldn't have been any better. I was genuinely happy, and half the time it felt as though I was floating on the clouds of her love. That is until it happened. You see, Trish was pregnant again when Lily was just two years old, and everything was going according to plan until she went into labor. I still remember the doctor telling me that some complications arose during the childbirth. They were not able to save Trish. I remember wondering what I was going to do with my life and the children as I sank to the floor in the hospital corridor. The next two weeks after that were a blur, and I wondered what would have happened to Caesar and Lily if my mother D hadn't stepped in. She was the one who took over and had to take care of a newborn baby and a two-year-old who kept asking and crying for her mummy. It was the worst time of my life, and as much as I am ashamed to say, I didn't even want to look at Caesar at that point. I couldn't bear the pain I felt when I saw him with his hair just like Trish's. Eventually, with the help of my mother and siblings, I started to come around and do basic things. Now, seven years later, although I am relatively stable, the pain of losing Trish hadn't gone, and it came in flashes like this. She was, and would always be, the love of my life, but. I tried to move on for the sake of the children, most especially. Just as I was about to descend from my staircase, my mother poked her head in and saw me. "Hey, sleepyhead," she said sweetly. "Hi, ma'am," I replied as I gave her a hug. "I didn't hear you come in last night. Long day?" she asked, with concern etched on her face. "You could say that." I had to run the inventory for the first quarter, and it took much more time than I had anticipated. I said. All right, the children are in the kitchen," she said as she walked into the laundry room. I didn't know what I would have done without my mother. My father died two years after Trish did, and since then she has been staying permanently at my place and helping me look after the children. She also helped me on occasions when the children asked for their mother, and I didn't know what to say. I couldn't have been more grateful. We also helped each other work through grief. Coming from the staircase, I went into the kitchen. Hi, guys, I said. Hey, Dad, Lily said, scrunching her nose, probably in a bid to figure out a new word in her book. Hi, Dad, Caesar said, still engrossed with his toy car. Grandma made us blueberry pancakes, she said. It was a special treat since my birthday is tomorrow, Caesar said, with a huge smile on his face. Caesar's birthday has always been a bit problematic for me because it always reminded me of the day Trish died. But I tried to dampen that feeling for him. He wasn't in any way at fault for that. Oh yeah, I replied. You got me a birthday present, right? He asked. Of course, buddy, 
With all the constant reminders you have been giving me, I have, I answered. Good, he said. What do you guys feel like doing this beautiful Saturday morning? I asked the both of them. I want to go to an amusement park, Dad, Caesar said. What about you, Lily? I asked her, knowing full well what her answer would be. Anywhere I can read is fine with me, she said. All right, then I'll go ask Grandma if she'd like to come with us, I said. After asking my mother if she was interested, taking a shower and packing snacks, we all set out on our way. Two Kids Want a Dog Chapter 2 As the manager of a jewelry store, I get to meet different people every day. Coming back to tell my family about how my day went, and the people I met is usually the highlight of my day. That particular day I had witnessed a particularly funny event and I couldn't wait to tell them all about it. When I entered the house, I saw that my mother was putting the finishing touches on the meal. The children were doing their homework at the kitchen island. After taking a quick shower, I helped them finish and set the table. So, how was your day, Caesar? I asked. It was awesome, Dad. Tori got this new cool toy and he let me play with it during lunch, he said excitedly. What kind of toy is that, buddy? I asked. It's a remote-controlled plane, he said, making flying noises. Sounds interesting, I told him. I then turned to Lily and asked her the same question. How was your day, sweetheart? I said. It was fine, Dad. We got the result of a test today and I passed. Also, I got the lead role in the school play, she finished. Wow, that's great, Lily. I'm so proud of you, I said. Thanks, Dad, she replied. I got the role in a play, too, Caesar chipped in. Yeah, one of the boys fell sick and he was replaced by Caesar, she said. And he pulled the scene off effortlessly, too, she continued. I am so proud of the both of you, I said to them. I turned to my mother, Dee, and asked, So, Mum, how was your day? Oh, well, you know, the usual, she said. I sold some of my paintings today on the site you introduced me to. Is it eBay? I asked. Oh, yes, that one. I was able to sell them for a really good price, too, she continued excitedly. When my father died, my mother began to look for something that would aid her healing process and keep her busy, and she discovered painting. She has been doing it for quite a while, and although she is too modest to agree, she is pretty good at it. I recently set up an eBay account for her and encouraged her to sell some of them on the site. I was happy that she was doing something she loved and making money out of it. How was your day, Dad? Lily asked me. Oh, it was good. The weirdest thing happened to me today, I said, eager to share the events of my day with them. What, Dad? Caesar asked. Okay, this customer walks into the store and asks for a bracelet for her dog. She wanted 24 cards gold and was willing to pay any amount for it. Why would someone want to buy a 24 cards gold bracelet for a dog? My mother asked in bewilderment. Beats me, I answered her. Dad, can we get a dog? Caesar asked. Yes, Dad, can we? Lily joined in. I looked to my mother for support, but it seemed like she wanted me to handle it by myself, and she wasn't going to interfere. I quickly ran through the best way to approach the problem without hurting their feelings. For one, I wasn't sure that both of them remotely knew what owning and taking care of a dog entailed, and I did not want to give my mother extra work to do. Then, there was a probability of something happening to the dog, and I didn't want them to experience another loss so early in life. Uh, buddy, I'm not sure that is a good idea right now, I said. Why not, Dad? He countered. Well, for one, who is going to take care of the dog? I asked. I will, he quickly replied. Me too, Lily said. I was very surprised that she was taking sides with him this way. They do not agree on things, so this was a new development. Why do you want a dog? I asked, turning to look at the both of them. Dogs are cool, Dad, Caesar said. What about you, Lil? I asked. Well, Caesar wants one, and dogs are cute, she said in reply. Honey, do you know the amount of work that goes into taking care of a dog? I asked her. No, Dad, but we can learn, they both whined. We promise to take care of the dog. You and Grandma do not have to worry. We will be in charge of feeding and cleaning and walking the dog, Lily said. I was tempted at that moment to concede when I saw the looks on their faces, but I did not want to seem like a pushover. I looked at my mum one last time, and as if she sensed the desperation in my eyes, she decided to step in and intervene, which I was more than thankful for. 
darlings, you can't get a dog now, she said calmly. You guys are not capable of taking care of one now, and your father and I would not be able to help you out, she continued. If you guys will wait until you're older, then you can get a dog, she finished. I could see the disappointment etched on their faces, but I did not want to concede. They both grumbled a little, and it was evident that both of them were sad about the whole situation. They proved it by ignoring me and their grandma and skipping their usual goodnight kiss. Family Vacation Chapter 3 I was at the store that night, going through the inventory of the day and trying to tie up loose ends, which was generally when my regional manager would come in. As the regional manager, he has to occasionally take rounds monitoring the jewelry stores, and for the past week, he had been monitoring this one. He knocked gently on the door and I opened it for him to come in. Hi Brian, I'm just about to round up here, I said, not wanting to delay him. Oh, it's no problem, I wanted to talk to you about something else, he said. I briefly wondered what it might be about and took note of his facial features to determine if it was a good or a bad thing, but I didn't get much of a clue. I was wondering... I have this dog, and she recently gave birth to six puppies. We most definitely cannot take care of all of them. We've been giving them out and are still left with three. Do you want one for your children? Well, this is a huge coincidence. The other day they were asking for a puppy. They cried when I told them they wouldn't be getting one, but I have been feeling bad for them. I said to him, well, it looks like they're very lucky children. What are the odds? He asked. They will be so happy, I replied. Could you come for it tonight? He asked. Yeah, sure. I am finished here. I will just lock up and come with you. I replied. I quickly finished what I was doing and locked up the store, and then we both entered our cars and as Brian led the way, I followed him to his house. I could picture the look on the children's faces and how excited they would be. I thought to myself that we would have to figure out how to take care of the puppy eventually. We soon got to his house and he signaled for me to wait outside while he went in to bring the puppy outside. He came back 10 minutes later with a box containing the puppy, which was a black and brown German Shepherd dog. I thanked him very much and was soon on my way home. I got home just in time for dinner and they were already seated at the table. I walked into the dining area and they all looked at me curiously, wondering what was in the box. I have something for you kids, I said. They both looked up that instance, wondering what I was referring to. I placed the box on a corner of the table and motioned for them to look in. Wow, Dad, is that a real puppy? Caesar asked. Yes, buddy, I said as I looked over at my mother. She had a smile on her face that she knew I was going to concede sooner or later. I smiled back at her as I watched the children play with the puppy. They looked so happy and for that moment, I didn't even care who was going to take care of it. I just wanted them to have it if it was going to make them happy. Two weeks later, the children had already gotten enamored with the dog and true to their words, they took turns taking care of it and feeding it. They had still not chosen a name for the dog, however, and still called it the dog. I kept asking them, but they both had not come to an agreement about it. I found them arguing about it one day, and they managed to drag me and their grandmother into the conversation. Dad, what do you think of the name Casper? Caesar asked. Grandma D, you too? Lily said. Like Casper the ghost? I asked. Yeah, he said. That is such a dumb name, Lily interjected. Which name do you prefer, Lily? I asked. Ollie, she said proudly. I found the name in the book, and the dog was the smartest and the bravest. Our dog will be too, and he should be called Ollie, she finished. I am not sure I like any of the two names, guys, my mother said. You guys should keep running through the names with each other. I don't like any of them either, I told them. Challenge accepted, Caesar said to his sister as he went to his room, probably to write down a long list of accepted dog names. You bet, Lily said also. The brother and sister's rivalry was very funny to behold. I knew that they loved each other a whole lot, as it was so obvious from the little things they did and said to each other. My mother and I smiled at each other, and I stopped to observe her for a moment. She looked tired, and I decided on a whim that we all needed a break from our lives. Mom, what do you think about going somewhere next weekend? Or for like five or so days? I think that would be perfect, she said. Where do you have in mind? She asked. I was thinking of the National Forest down in Tahoe. What do you think about it? I asked. Oh, I think it's perfect, Scott. I have heard so many good things about that place. She answered. I can book the trip today, 
I will go tell the children about it now, I said. Okay, dear, she replied. I am looking forward to it, she continued with a smile on her face. I hadn't seen her smile properly for quite a while and I planned to make sure she had as much fun as she could during the vacation. After the children who received the news with so much excitement, I went to the study to book the vacation and plan out the itinerary during the trip. I also took a leave of absence from the store for about two days, just in case the trip extended. Brian, the regional manager, was very supportive and he granted it to me. On the last whim, as I was rounding up their arrangements, I saw an offer to rent a small plane that could take us conveniently to the National Forest, and since the plan was to offer my family comfort, I decided to splurge on it. I was looking forward to this trip. The News Chapter 4 Two days before the trip, the children came up to me with the dog in tow. One day, while I was in the kitchen, they told me that they had finally decided on a name for the dog. Curious to know what it might be, I asked and they both said it at the same time. Frankie, they said. Frankie, I asked. Who came up with it? I continued. We both did, Dad. We both liked the name, Lily said. Yeah, Caesar seconded her. Well, I think I like this name. I can picture this dog as a Frankie. I said, looking at the both of them, Well, Frankie, welcome to the family, I said to the dog, and as though he heard me, it barked in response, and the children and I laughed. When your grandma Dee comes back from church, you can tell her the name of the dog, I added. It was the day of the trip, and we were all making sure we had packed everything we would be needing for the trip. Thanks to my mother, who had the insight of cross-checking everything, there was no need to go through our packed belongings in a frenzy in a bid to check that we had all we needed. We said a short and quick prayer, committing our journey into the hands of God, and proceeded to drive to the airport. When we got there, we had to look out for the small aircraft that would be taking us directly to the National Forest. It was at that moment that I noticed that the clouds had begun to gather and it was looking very much like it was going to rain. I turned to my mother to voice my concern, but I saw her already looking at the clouds as well. It looks like it's going to storm, Scott, she said. Would it be a good idea to travel on a plane with impending weather? She asked. I don't know, ma'am. The pilot would be in a better position to answer that question. The journey is considerably short. It would take 42 minutes at the maximum from what I saw on their website, I said. As I was speaking, a man walked up to us and introduced himself as the pilot. Is this the Doherty family? He asked. Yes, it is, I replied. Is it safe to still fly in this weather? I asked. The safety of my family was my utmost concern. Yes, if we get started now, we can beat the rain and get well out of its way before it starts, he said. All right, then you are the expert, I said, as we all followed him to the plane. The journey was going good until about 15 minutes into it. We started experiencing turbulence and the rain was getting heavier. The pilot was shouting commands into his headset but it didn't seem like anybody was answering. Everywhere was a mess. The dog kept barking uncontrollably. The children were crying and holding tightly onto me and my mother had fear written all over her face. I tried to keep up a facade of calm to help diffuse the tension but even I was scared. It felt as though we were being tossed around in the air by the strong winds and rain. The last thing before blacking out was Caesar and Lizzie clutching each other's hands frantically and managing to hold onto the dog at the same time. Then everything went dark for me, but let Frankie tell what happened next. I was excited to be going on the trip with the family and everything was going so well until the plane started to calm down fast. Everyone was screaming and Caesar and Lizzie tried to hold me as tightly as possible. When it finally went down, I was the only one awake. I know this because I used my muzzle to nudge all of them and I even barked one or two times, but nobody moved. After barking for a while with no help in sight, I decided to do something. I started with Caesar and Lizzie. I tried to move them out of the plane. It was no small feat, especially since I was still growing. I sunk my jaws into Caesar's shirt, making sure not to touch flesh, and I began to drag. At first, nothing happened, but over time he started to move from his original position. I did this for quite a while, and by the time I had moved Lizzie too, it was already dark outside and I was starting to get scared and hungry. After licking their faces for some time, they both began to stir and they finally woke up. I jumped excitedly and wagged my tail to indicate happiness at this new development, but both of them did not pay attention to me. They both ran into the plane to see their father and grandma still unconscious. It was then that I began to bark loudly. I knew that if we stayed here at the crash site, nothing was going to happen. 
Nobody was going to come to our rescue. Both of them came out of the plane and were very sad about what happened. What are we going to do now? Caesar asked, looking up to his elder sister. I don't know, Lizzie said. I thought you knew everything from the books you read, Caesar said. Well, if what they say in the books is true, then the airport would have informed the police and TV stations about the accident and help might be on the way, Lizzie said. I had always thought she was so smart. So we wait here, Caesar asked. I guess we do, she said. Are you sure it is safe? Maybe we should go look for help. Caesar said. I don't know anymore, I just want daddy, Lizzie said. I watched both of them as they huddled together and tried to keep warm. I had heard noises in the forest and I knew we could not stay there, not if we wanted to get back home alive. It was then I stood up, jumped around in circles and started running in the opposite direction. Not wanting to lose track of me, they followed me. I was glad that I could at least persuade them to leave the dangerous place. We walked through the forest and I made sure the children were in front of me so I could keep an eye on them. They were still optimistic and walked fast so they could get help for their father, grandma and the pilot, but as time went on, they got tired. I sighted a clearing that I deemed to be safe enough for the night and I tried to call their attention to it by barking. Luckily for me, they got the hint and we all stayed there for the night. The next day was very rough, as the forest seemed to have no end in sight. We all trudged ahead silently, and even the kids did not talk this time. They were too hungry and tired. We walked for quite a while and came across a shed in a clearing, with smoke coming from the top, and the children hurriedly rushed towards it. They were happy at the prospects of finally finding help, and I followed them reluctantly. Right before they got to the entrance of the shed, we all heard a gunshot, which made us pause in our tracks. Right on cue, three men came out, dragging the lifeless body of another man, and they saw us when they looked up. Grab them, one of them said. At first, we were all frozen in shock, but as they started running towards us, I barked to break the spell, and we all started running towards a path. We didn't know what to expect, and I could feel how scared Caesar and Lizzie were. The man could be carrying a gun. We ran for what seemed like hours, and then we got to a river which flowed too fast and looked too dangerous to cross, but we could not stop, knowing fully well that the man might be behind us. I ran towards the other side and saw a part of the river that didn't look as dangerous as the others. I ran back to the children, tugging on Caesar's clothes and barking furiously. We didn't have much time left. I think he's trying to tell us something, Caesar said. Let's follow him, his sister agreed. Together, we navigated our way through the river and we were all so exhausted when we got to the other side. The children found a clearing and promptly fell asleep holding onto each other. I couldn't sleep though. I knew that we would not be able to survive in the forest for an extra day. I was already hungry and didn't know how long I could keep up my strength. After checking to see that they would be safe, I started running down a path. After running for about 20 minutes, I found people holding lamps and calling out the children's names. I started barking and wagging my tail furiously to catch their attention and I was successful on a third attempt. I started running back in the direction I came from, pausing now and then to make sure the rescuers were following me. In a short while, we got to where the children were and they were shaken awake and checked over for injuries. Do you know where the others are, buddy? One of the men asked me and I barked in reply. I took the men back through the path we were on and finally we got to the plane. Scott, Dee and the pilot were still unconscious and the plans were made to move them to the hospital. This is an amazing dog, one of the rescuers said while giving me a treat which I quickly wolfed down. I didn't know I was as hungry as I was. You deserve more, big guy, he said while laughing and dropped more for me which I ate with the same gusto. This dog saved his whole family, someone commented. I haven't seen anything like it before, another person said. His name is Frankie, one of the children said it earlier. Someone quipped in. Someone with a camera came and took pictures of me and the kids together and many of me alone. I didn't care for all that, I was just happy that my family was safe. Scott continues the story. When I gained consciousness, I found myself in a hospital bed, and my thoughts immediately went to my mother, the children, Frankie and the pilot, but before I could stand up from the bed, I was restricted by a friendly-looking nurse. You have quite a dog, she told me, but I could not wrap my head around what she was trying to say. Try as much as possible not to stress yourself, you need all the rest you can get. She continued as she held up a clipboard and filled in some information. Do you think you're up for seeing a visitor? She asked, and I nodded. She turned around to motion to someone outside, and immediately my sister walked in and ran to my bedside. Oh God, Scott, I was so scared when I heard the news. How do you feel? My sister, Tracy, asked. 
I feel pretty okay, I replied. Have you seen mom and the children? I asked. Yes, they are perfectly fine. You don't have to worry about anything, she told me. I'll leave you guys for now, but please, ma'am, try as much as possible to take it easy on him. The nurse said, facing my sister. Sure, thank you, my sister said. Do you know what happened? I managed to utter out to my sister. Yes, the children told me, but you have to lie down properly first. You heard the nurse, my sister said. You will hear all about it when you get better. Everyone is fine. There is no need to worry, she continued. Uh, okay, I said. You just take your time and try to recover. I am right here. You don't have to worry about any of this. It's all in the past and I am here to help you take care of everything until you can, she said in a reassuring tone. All right, thank you, Trace, I replied. The drugs the nurse gave me before leaving were already kicking in and before I slipped off, all I could think about was how God sends help to us in the strangest of ways. When I woke up, my mother and the children were in my room alongside with Frankie. After hugging all of them, I looked over at Frankie, who sat there innocently looking at all of us. My mother talked then. The TV station wants to do a special on Frankie, our little hero, she said while gently rubbing his back, which he looked like he was enjoying. Oh, when? I asked. As soon as you think you can handle all the noise, my mother said. It's not so much of a big deal, though. They just want to take pictures of all of us together, she explained. Well, let's do it now then, I said. Are you sure you can handle it, baby? She asked, and I nodded in response. She signaled for the news reporter and his cameraman to come in, and after setting up, they took the picture and promised to send us the first copy of the newspaper released, and also told us to watch the 9pm news. It was all a surreal experience, and afterward, I couldn't help but think to myself that God must really love me and my family. I mean, how could a normal dog have done all that? The thought of my family all safe and sound put a smile on my face as I drifted back to sleep. Thank you for listening to my story. I am Gian. I would like to invite you to go to my website, mygiancarlo.com, or you can go to the Facebook page, Gian Audiobooks. Also, you can check our YouTube channel, Gian Audiobooks. Thank you.